Hello and welcome to the Behind the Beat podcast with me, Katie Russell from Planet Drum Music School in London. Join us as we talk to special guests and industry professionals about all things music. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to the Behind the Beat podcast with me, Katie Russell from the Planet Drum Music School in London. Today we are joined by Martin Johnson and we are so happy to have him here today and I will let him, I'll let him introduce himself. So Martin, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, um, well, the good thing is I've never had a real job, which I love, <laughs> you know, I've just been I've doing hitting things for a living all my life. Um, so I've been very fortunate. So, so my background, for those who don't know, is I've been a touring, just, you know, what you'd call a working pro, working session player, et cetera, et cetera, for X amount of years. Um, and my background is basically right through from jazz and bebop and big band. That was my real training, even though I don't look like it with the, with the peroxide blonde hair. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, traditionally, that's where I sort of my background was. I started off in rock, then got into heavy duty into jazz i was very lucky at a young age to literally on my doorstep from where my parents lived who knew nothing about music to study with a guy called bob armstrong Mm. um who unbeknown to me at the time was going to become one of the most revered uk drum tutors or in or if not in europe as well um but that was totally fortunate took me under his wing i studied with him up to the age of about 18 when basically i came in one day and went okay, I need time to digest all this. And he was like, I've been trying to get you to leave for ages. I've been pushing you hard. <laughs> uh, and, you know, in the nicest possible way, um, get out there and do it. And um, and that's what I've been doing ever since. And my background, as I said, is I've done, you know, I'm what you call just a working drummer. You know, it's it's like all of us. It's um, I do big gigs. I do stadium gigs. I do big tours with big pop acts and rock acts. And then I do little jazz club gigs one night. And then I'll be doing a session here in my own studio or on another studio. Um, and that's it, really. And then on top of that as well, I've always... I've been fortunate, I suppose, that, that because of Bob, I've took on board as in, you know, n- there should not be mysteries in music. We should be able to explain it. And from him... I suppose naturally I just gravitated towards doing a little bit of teaching. People used to ask me at the end of gigs, do you do any teaching? I was like, oh, yeah, never really thought about it. And by the time I was 18, I was doing some lessons and stuff. And then that's always been an arm of what I do as well. Not out of necessity, more to do the fact that I actually enjoy doing it. And I like to take the mystery out of it. Uh, and I think there's a lot of, you know, uh, there's a lot of people who try to teach who make it more maybe more difficult than it should be. It's like yeah. you know what we're not yeah. saving lives here. We're uh-huh. not we're not neurosurgeons. When no one's going to die if we get something wrong. So let's just strip it back to what it is and 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 you know make it accessible to everybody in some manner. So that's that's where I'm at. And um, yeah, it's it's. I suppose you would call it in the modern day scenario a portfolio career. I have lots of revenue streams. Mm. I've got, you know, stuff that's out there being played on radio. I've got publishing deals. I've got this and that. It's just, you know, what better way to to make a living other than just to be surrounded by something musical? Well, that's exactly. great. So you seem to be uh, busy, you know, even though you know a lot of people have lost a lot of work. You seem to have been yeah. doing okay, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was it was it was obviously. We, we could foresee that something was going to happen and, you know, before the proper official lockdown, as it were. I mean, literally that week I was one one day I was playing to 25,000 people out in Lithuania in a headline in a, a stadium, an arena gig. And the next night I didn't gig for 18 months. Wow. Do you know what I mean? It's like that's like really was like literally one day you're kind of walking on stage to thousands of people. And the next minute it's like, oh, I'm now just sitting at home. And I've... so well, what did you do when when that happened? Well, to, I was really fortunate because 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 I, I yeah, first of all I've I've always done I've for years I've done sort of the remote sessions kind of thing so that kind of was was coming along and then people were you know wanting projects done and bits and pieces so you know that that was cool but I was very lucky because I was already I, I lecture at BIM in Birmingham oh. um, and because I'm already involved was all, already involved in a slightly technical side there as well, where they were trying to get into sort of blended learning and maybe trying some platforms 
the year or so previous to, to COVID. Mm. That role stopped, but then as soon as this happened, literally I just got a call and was like, can you come and start doing stuff on the digital learning side? Not nice. just for the Birmingham BIM, but for the whole BIM group all around Europe. Wow. It was like, okay, then it was, there was a little task force of, I suppose, of about, I don't know, probably initially probably about a dozen of us between all the seven or eight sites all around Europe who were going, right, I was literally saying, okay, how many hours do you want of me? And they literally within a split second, they gave me an answer to say, how many hours have you got? So I just went from doing, thinking I wasn't going to do anything for, you know, at that time, we probably didn't know how long it was going to last for. We probably thought maybe three months, maybe six months. I was already being pessimistic or maybe realistic in hindsight, thinking to myself, well, the gigging and the touring is not going to come right for at least another year. This is in the very first week of lockdown. Mm -hmm. I knew everything had been wiped out. Mm -hmm. And people were saying, oh, maybe we can get back to get to it you know, within six months. And I was like, no, nothing's going to come right for mm -hmm. another year. But I was very lucky in that, in that they literally I had this kind of you know arm of what I do. And they were like, just give us as many hours as you want. We need to keep these degree courses going online and and give the student experience so i was bench testing zoom i was doing all these things a million and one applications just to just to you know put in some serious hours in but mm. at, to be fair i loved it because it's it appeals to the nerdy techie side of my <laughs> my you know personality yeah. i yeah. think a lot of us yeah, uh, no, I, was, I always wanted to do that for ages, you know, go go online, but we we never did it, you know. So. Yeah, for ages, and, and, Alan was sort of telling me like we need to yeah. we need to go online, yeah. like we need to work this out, and then obviously it gave us the perfect opportunity to do that. So, I mean, there's lots as, as much as it's been pretty crap. There's lots of great things that have come out from this pandemic, <laughs> you know, there really has, and, and and there's lots of things where where things would not have happened had this had this happened. You're right, um, and, one of, and one of these things being this, this whole and one having to be immersed in it. And I, I mean, mm. I was literally just, a, it, it sounds like quite sick, but I was enjoying breaking things in that first couple of weeks because there'd be these apps that we were recommended and I'd go in and go, no, it can't do it. I'd, I'd dig it to a certain distance and go, this is not, this is not doing what it says on the tin. It's not doing what it says. So then we'd have to sack it off and just go, right, that's in the sidelines. So I'd just be researching and really just trying to get everything sorted. I mean, from from a from a lecturing teaching point of view, I was doing some lecturing and teaching anyway. And we had, from what I recall, the lockdown was announced on the was it on the Monday night? Yeah, it was I think on the so. Monday night. And I think by the Wednesday morning, I had I had to work out how I was going to deliver what they call an LPW, which is a live performance workshop, two sessions, each one holding forty students. Oh gosh! How to do that online when normally we'd be in a building, get them to play in bands. How do you keep that that engagement? How mm. do you still deliver it to some worthwhile kind of thing? That's quite interesting. Within three uh, hours, I had to work out how to do it, and we were how like, did you, oh, "How did you deal with people playing together?" Then you can't. I you mean, can't. literally straight away. So, so, so that's one of the things I was, you know, that you got all these other, you got all these apps saying, "Oh, you can stream, you can do that." No, we we we're, we're governed by the speed of light. Unfortunately, the speed of light is a, is a finite speed, and therefore we're going to get a delay. We can't go fast in the speed of light. So by the time something's gone along the cable up to a satellite, back again, we're screwed. Mm. Um, um, so we sort of realised that was we knew that wasn't I knew that wasn't going to work. We were getting people to perform their tracks. We what what I did straight away was we got the track that we were working that week and I just downloaded like karaoke versions of it and tried to get as many stems mm -hmm. as possible so that students could actually play it in their own environment and just play it via the webcam which obviously had its massive drawbacks because at that point Zoom was still just a conference thing it was all like speech recognition and not really the high fi uh, music mode yes. um so obviously there was lots of problems with cutting out and people having decent internet, et cetera, et cetera. So then what we did was I, we had, I just re rethought it with, with, the, with my colleague who I lead that session with and was like, okay, we need to do this different. And so what we did instead was he said to them, right, rather than performing, you have to create a performance, which is basically means them collaborating, sending stems to each other, getting really immersed in DAWs. And within a couple of weeks, we had like some amazing things where like kids who had never done that before, or I say kids, you know, young adults who had never done that kind of thing before, were given a split screen, perfectly synced performances. 
and we were getting them to upload it into like a OneDrive and then playing it during the sessions and giving feedback. So we mm. done it as a as a digital kind of uh, you know stems recording virtual session thing. They then uploaded it by the time we started the session for the lecture, and then everyone watched the performances. I I streamed it, and then everyone gave feedback on it. So we we tried to make it like a yeah. normal session, but in a box. I think that it works really well. That's you know. what um you know a lot of sessions like professional sessions are doing nowadays because say if you want to collaborate with an artist who lives in america you know yeah. you a lot of it is sort of done you know you're sending over stems and you're, you're doing it all exactly. online i've now, done that you? for years yeah and i mean, I mean I've cheaper just done than some flying someone out Nashville. <laughs> sorry cheaper than flying someone out absolutely and i've got you know i've got more kit here i've got more drum kits here and more cymbals and more percussion and more and a good choice of microphones and i've got you know, I've got some really good mic preamps. I spent invested a lot of money in my mic preamps so I could rival big studios. So I've got Neve, I've got API, I've got Dakin, which is based on the Trident desks. I've got Audient. You know, I've um, so my my whole ethos here anyway. I've I've done that for years, and and you know, it is how it how it goes. I mean, I've just done. I'm just part way through the first half of an album for, for Nashville with some, and some of the writers have just got uh, 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 some of the staff writers there are like on Barbra Streisand's new album. So it's great. It's like I'm collaborating with people that I would never normally collaborate with. Uh -huh. Nice. Wow. You know, so it's, it's cause they trust what I do. They trust my recordings. Okay. There's a bit of a time lag. By the time I finish the session, I have to wait for them to go approval or not. But most of the times it's pretty on the money, maybe a few tweaks and it's, mm. I could walk eight paces and I've got a cup of coffee. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean. I'm, uh, so it's it's it, it's great. It's a different way of working. Yeah. Um, that's a whole other thing we can chat about, which is which is the dynamic of of online sessions. You know, I for me they're not as good as playing in a room with people. I don't think it I ever mean, is going ideal, to be. In an it? ideal world, we'd have a big even tracking in a studio when you're on your own is not as good as playing in an environment where you've got the whole rhythm section playing or and maybe just a guide vocal or well, you, you, you need the vibe playing. you know you only get the vibe yeah. if you've got people around you know that's yeah. absolutely i mean there's so there's there's you, you can you can emulate it to a certain degree and you can emulate if you know the players on the on the session you, i know certain bass players almost what they'll play and they'll almost know what i'm going to play because mm. you know not in a kind of formulaic way but we just know each other's playing so well yeah but there's still that that moment that that moment of a left turn or a right turn in the music. You can't that doesn't exist. So yeah. are, are you back into uh, face to face sessions and recording and and gigs and stuff now? Started to a little bit. Yeah. But to yeah. be honest, you know, as you know, a lot of the large format studios are are, are, are are starting to fold and go. It's only the big ones that are really really funded. They've got big kind of notoriety of surviving. Um, so it, it is. It is a real shame because I think that environment's going to go. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that there'll be lots more kind of medium size or small, like mm -hmm. rehearsal come decent studios who will have some really nice bits of equipment where people can start to mm -hmm. do these kind of things. But the large studios are generally, a, 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 you know, revenue wise, they're being bought out to yeah. develop into flats or housing or flattened or, you know, it's. So, I know they, um, they closed down Angel Studios. Angel, and yeah. I mean, that yeah. was once when that was going, that was a big like, oh, okay, if that's going, that really is just shows what's going on. Mm. You know, unfortunately. I mean, Abbey Road is only just about hanging on by a skin of its teeth. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's, um, but yeah, it's, um, it's a different, different way of thinking. It's yeah. a different way of thinking, you know. It's not what I got into music for. I got into music to play with my mates and have a fun. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. And I still keep that as part of my ethos. Exactly. You know, I'll still go out and do gigs. I now I don't live in London anymore. Just I used to live outside London. I've still got a house down there, but I'm now up, up in Solihull, so Birmingham, near Birmingham. But I'll still come down. You know, I'll still come down and do gigs for like with my mates for virtually no money. It doesn't make sense because to me, it's, I've got to keep that hobby side, that that fun yeah. of playing. But with it's because you enjoy it, you know. I love, I love the it. Money. You yeah. know, even even the worst gig with the worst artists that I really don't particularly want to work with, that I'm kind of like thinking, well, this pays the bills. Yeah. I'm still going. Do you know what? I could be digging holes in the road for a living on a wet like like the weather we've got now. Or the, yeah. you know, it's it's still a great job. Exactly. But I'm not going to ever get a bitch about it. <laughs> so, do you have any sort of tips or advice for someone who maybe wants to 
take their drumming further and wants to start playing professionally, like someone who's maybe coming to the end of of having lots of lessons and they want to take that step and want to make a bit of a career out of it. Do you have any advice for anyone like that? Yeah, yeah, and it's a really easy bit of advice. Say yes to everything and worry about it after. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah, honestly, it's like there's a matter of times I've said yes to something gone, why did I say yes? Why did I say yes? And I was just, you know... Um, I went through, I went through, a, I said, this is something that Bob, Bob, and I, I told this story the other day to someone. They was like, oh, God, that's really good. Uh, I remember when I was younger, going to, a, I was, I was, I was probably, I just got my driving license. So I must have been about 17. Just be, uh, just towards the end of my time with Bob. And um, I came in, I'd been offered uh, the Radio 2 big band, not the main big band, but the actual rehearsal big band, which is still quite a big deal. It's like a lot of the guys from the Radio 2 big band or the, or the B, the B list players. Would still go in there, and it'll be it'll be the MD'd by the by the, the deputy MD for the BBC Radio Two Big Band. So I got offered this, and I started to sub on that um, up in Portland Place in in London. And uh, and I re- remember coming in, and I was just before the first one. I had a lesson with Bob. I think it was about a few days before. And after that ten minutes, he just looked at me, and went, "What's up?" I was like, "I've just been, I was busy off this this Radio Two Big Band thing." He went, "Yeah, great, go and do it." He went. I mean, I'm not sure I'm good enough. I'm not sure I can, you know, these guys are like seasoned pros and I'm like 17 years old coming in here to do do this. And he just looked at me and he went, what are you worried about? They know. I went, what do you mean they know? He went, they wouldn't have called you if they didn't think you could do it. I was like, what? He went, they know. They're not going to risk anything. They, they know you can do it. You might not, but they do. And that really put me at ease because after a little while of kind of just processing that, it was like, well, I wouldn't have got the shout. I wouldn't have got the call if they exactly. didn't think I could do it. I didn't think I could do it, but they obviously saw something in me or whoever gave me the call. And he was, he was like, they know. They're not, they're not going to want anyone who's a weak link there. Yeah. So that's what I've called you. How did he go on the day? Oh, he was great. It was fine. <laughs> and then I'd done that for on and off for about a year or so, you know. Mm. Um, and, it, it, and and yeah, it was it was great. Yeah, so it was it was fine. I, to be honest, and, and I don't really remember it. It was all a blur. Everything and worry about it. It was after. all a blur of sight reading charts, heavy duty charts. I was I remember loading into Portland Place, and they used to rehearse in the, in the in one of the lower lower rehearsal rooms. Um, and I just remember driving back the first time, going, "What just happened?" It was just like five up, four or five hours of blur. <laughs> but yeah, I'm looking at that book you've got here. Is oh. that a- is that a new book? That one? Is that new? That's the Steve Gadd one, The Gadiments. I haven't even looked at it yet. Okay, because I was thinking of getting it. Can, can you tell yeah. us a little bit about it? Because obviously, um, you know, Steve Gadd, some people might not know Steve Gadd, but obviously it's a really big influence on, on all of us, right? Oh, man. And that's, man, his, that's, that's uh, his new book, yeah? yeah? That's, this is the, I think this is the first book he's written. So what, is, what it is... I've, to, to be honest, I haven't looked at it. It's all just hand stuff. It's all just like, you know, all sort of Charlie Wilcoxon kind of stuff and, you know, all his hand kind of licks. His own little warm-ups, his own little variations and stuff. Um, but apparently these are stuff, just musings that he's kind of scribbled out and then he's had it written okay. out. This, this is the first ever book he's actually written. Okay, I'm um, going to get that, 100%. Yeah, yeah. I mean... I haven't, to be honest, it's sitting up there to remind me to look at it, but I haven't <laughs> had the chance to look at it. <laughs> but it's quite a cool cover, so hey, we'll have it in the background. Uh, Martin, who, who are your favourite drummers? I know it's a very difficult question, right? Oh, Big but, question. But, but listen, listen, you go on a desert island and oh, you yeah. have... Oh, no, this, is what, hey, this, is what give, this is what I give my students. You've heard me doing this to my students. Yeah, you've, okay. you, you've got to take five records, right? Okay, not even okay. ten. Five. So tell me, what, what are you going to take? Okay, so it's not about necessarily just about drummers. It's it's just about musicians. Well, drummers, and music. I, think, I think about music, but obviously we've got drummers in there, yeah? Yeah, well, though one of them won't have a drummer in. So Keith Jarrett, the Cone concert, will go yep. in there straight away. Mm-hmm. Weather Report, the live Weather Report, at the 830 album. Yeah, I saw that There's gig. A... Oh, man, that's yeah. just like... Yeah. Just, I saw it in just... uh, Antibes in uh, South of France. Man, and that... 79 that I was. album that album when i was a kid i just put i've got a vinyl still and it, i yeah. put, used to just listen to that and just imagine i was on stage with jacko and wayne amazing and, man and, yeah and, and joe zawin was just incredible on it 
He's just like people just look not people gloss over Joe, but he's mm. just just amazing. Mm. Just what he does, but left and right hand and. Uh, yeah. And uh, you know, like, you know, when he's in unison or in harmony with with Jacko or with Wayne, it's just, just, it's just immense. And um, Peter Erskine, yeah, yeah, and the energy. I mean, it's all it's all flying by the seat of their pants to a certain extent. The adrenaline in that that gig is just amazing. So there's two. Um, oh. Difficult. James Taylor, the double live album, which has got Carlos Vega on it. Okay. Okay. Mm, now, it's, now it's getting tricky. Yeah. Okay, I suppose I've got to have Cobham in there. Spectrum. Spectrum. Spectrum album, because I can sing every solo off that album pretty much at Jan Hammer and Tommy Bowden play. Wow, wow. And various others. Um, oh, God, there's that four. Oh, God, that's four. Okay, who are we going to do the Ooh, fifth one? One more, one more. And one more, one more. Um, um, cool. There's a whole album. Right. You may not know this album. There's a. There's a trumpet player called Ray Anthony from the 50s and 60s and 70s, from the 50s and 60s. Uh, and he's got one album, a real rare album, Bob put me onto this, called Swinging at the Tower, which is at the Cap- live at the Capitol Tower. It's got Alvin Stollo on drums. He doesn't do anything just other than swings his backside off. But the band is just, it's just, it's just joyous. What is it called again? Heavy... I'll write it down. So it's, it's Ray Anthony and it's called Swinging at the Tower. Okay. And literally Al Stolo on drums, all the setups are just literally all the band setups in a big band. There's no big flurries. There's no big Sunny Payne kind of flurries or Buddy Rich flurries. Most of the setups just go doom, 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 ka-ka, just two hits on the snare. But he just knows where to put them. Okay, excellent. But then again, if I could sneak another album in, then it would be Kind of Blue. Kind of Blue, well, of course. Well, I, I was going to say for, that, actually. Yeah. And for only one reason, Alan, for only one reason, uh, in So What, after the intro, when... Hang on, I've got a total mind blank. Who's Jimmy the drums that? It's Jimmy Cobb. Yeah, Jimmy Cobb. When Jimmy, Jimmy Cobb comes in on that ride, that sizzly ride, and he just hits that one note on the intro. Mm. Ba, ba, and it's just it's just note placement of note placement. So that sound, that note placement, given it its full breadth, full length, mm. it's just, if I could play one note in my entire life, it would be in that ride symbol. <laughs> <laughs> This just right. does something to me that way. It's, just yeah. it's, it's a really tough question, is it? Because when you start thinking about maybe John Bonham or you know Tony Williams or whoever it is, yeah. then you think, well, you know, there's so much stuff, you know. But yeah, I mean, it's a good question because at least you know it gets us to talk about music, you know. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. And then and then equally, I'm, I, then I feel bad now because I've I've left out Colton Barrett from the Whalers because he he invented he invented oh, reggae. I mean, yeah. You know, one, so it's like. Probably one of the most underrated drummers that ever lived, you know, because people don't... You put him in the top 500, he, he, a lot of times he wouldn't even show up and he should be, like, in the top 10. <laughs> You're right. You're right. Yeah. So, hey, difficult. Yeah, that was a pretty difficult question, to be fair. <laughs> um, no, so have I, you... I, I do appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. um, a couple of other things, if we've got time. Um, first I've one time. It's fine. is if you... Have you got any upcoming gigs or projects that you're working on at the moment and if we've got time maybe for a little um if you can show us something with your setup that would be amazing i'm yeah. not sure if it will sure, yeah, yeah. work on zoom but we'll give it a go um but yeah, you, yeah have work, you got any gigs coming up fine, basically um, so no, look gig gig wise i'm constantly gigging i'm all out with loads i'm still out with people you know a, a lot of stuff has now obviously been slightly derailed till 2022 um so I don't really keep an updated gig list these days for like public consumption, just because it became too exhaustive, and 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 also, I just I don't have enough time to generally yeah. keep my and yeah. any semblance of website up to date. So I, I um, yeah, I mean, I'm out. I'm touring with, and he's he's apparently got some very big things planned for next year, which he's not he's not revealing at the minute because he's keeping the cards very close to his chest. I'm talking with a young blues guitarist called Connor Selby, who's just awesome. He's He sounds like Ray Charles when he sings and plays like... Wow. He plays like... He plays like Ray Charles would if he played guitar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's just a Ray Charles freak. I mean, he, as in he just loves loves him. And he's, he's, he's 23, and it sounds like he's 55, 60. Wow. Love it. Wow. And he's incredible. Um, so I'm talking with him. He, What's just his name again? Connor Selby. Okay. Connor Selby. Check out his latest album. 
I'm not on the latest album. Um, Mike Sturgis is on the lot on the on the album because it was done in a a, a, a a session in an in-house studio. Um, but I'm touring with him. I know, you know, previously he's toured with The Who. The Who love him, funny, bizarrely. Um, uh, so he's he's great. So I've been doing some little shows with him. Just maybe warm-ups, just, just getting him in, get me into gig shape, really, before proper touring, but I was bought in that by a management company. Um, I'm still out on the road when she, she's just took, took me much two years off, unfortunately, during COVID, to have a baby, but with Joe Harmon. So she's starting to go back out on the road. So that's, you know, that's an immense gig because that's just musical, playing things at 40 beats per minute quietly. It's brilliant. I love that. I love doing that, you know, because... Um, and then I'll still be doing the fusion stuff. So every now and again, I'll go out with Guthrie, you know, I have done in the past, or I'll go out with any kind of the jazz fusion guys and then everything else in between. I'm still done some shows this year um, with... Well, the pop acts I, I I musically direct as well, Bewitched. So they've been that was out this summer, and they've got some more stuff for next year. Nice. I am that gig as well. Um, Amazing. And variety, load of variety of just a zillion other things, really. Yeah. So yeah. Great. Busy, Great. busy. I mean, it's good. It's amazing that you're busy. So. Um, yeah. I think we might be running out of time, but if I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I've, show I've us got a little time something also. on your setup. Yeah, I mean, I've got time. If you want need to re- redo the meeting and do a second half, I don't mind chatting for a bit longer. I'm fine. I'm cool with that. How long good we've, got? You, but... we've got? We've got eight minutes, I think. Oh, okay. See what I'm cramming. Yeah. So my setup. I'll quickly show you. I'll show you quickly show you on the screen. So yeah. So you were uh, showing us our setup. It was amazing. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just mute this mic and I'll go into the other room and put my headset on. So give me two seconds. Hopefully you better hear me. Give me a sec. Yeah, he was showing us this setup just before we started the podcast and we were we were having a bit of a nerd mm. about it, weren't we? <laughs> Hopefully all being well, you should be able to hear me. Yeah, I think we can hear you. Yeah, great. Okay. Yeah, so um I need to see you guys. So Hopefully that all sounds alright. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got. So I've yeah. So I've just got. Um, this is actually my, my recording setup. So one of many recording setups. So I just worked out a way of actually streaming it into my software and then put it into OBS, which then goes into Zoom. So you've basically got all the separate mics plus the overheads, um, and it just allows me to. Ha- during lockdown, it enables me to kind of like. Do some lecturing still um, via Zoom. Um, you know, I've just got it. You know, so if I've got, I want to run a click here. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. You know, so that's great. Yeah. The sound is really good. Yeah, really good. good. D- despite the playing, the sound is really good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So it, it, it's all cool. I mean, it's it's. It's going into you know horrendous thousands of pounds worth of mic preamps to then go into into Zoom on stereo. But hey, it's good. It's all good. Yeah, no, I mean it's that the drums sound really good coming out this end. So it's good. That's, that's so are, are you are you all dr- are all your drums are mic'd up? You've got uh, mics on the toms, overheads. Can you describe your your microphone setup a little bit? Yeah, so so the kick drum kick drum uh, at the minute the flavor of this this next few months is a beta 52 inside the kick all dix d6 on the outside on the port hole and a, and a sub kick my own made homemade sub kick because i don't believe in the yamaha ones let's don't even get started um so my own okay sub kick. and then we've got uh, just a good old 57 on the top of the snare and yep. i've been using a, a road nt5 not all right I don't, I don't like under snare mics a road nt5 but it's kind of pointing at the bottom half of the shell yeah i can okay. sort of see it there yeah so, you so can, can you just um, why why do you point it there? Because most drummers will have, will have it be below the snare drum. Yeah. Do you know why? Because bottom snare mics sound crap, and I refuse to give it to people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> of, okay. <laughs> what well, it just make just makes your snare drum sound like a crisp packet. Why do you want mm-hmm. that? You know, come on. You've just gotta make it sound good. So okay. Like, so it's, it's more snarey. Um, yeah. Um, so 
that hence the reason for using a, a condenser mic, but the NT5s NT and the NT55s, they really, really take the SBLs really well, the high, high sound pressure levels. Um, at the minute on the hi-hats, I've got a 451B, the AKG. I, use, I sometimes use an SM7B, which is a very expensive dynamic mic. Mm -hmm. I might use a 57 if I want a bit more kind of middle presence. But mm -hmm. at the minute, that's just a 451B. Which okay. Is, which very brittle sounding, but perfect for hats. Uh-huh. Tom mics, I'm always switching between good old 57s. I love 57s on Toms. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the minute, I've got some all dicks, D2s and D4s. Um, overheads are Shaw KSM32s, large diaphragm condensers, which are quite true sounding. And then on, on the right, I've got an NT5 as well, Rode NT5. So how many mics have you got on, on the kit? So, oh, now you asked me. Yeah. But then I've got then I've got one behind me which you're not getting, and I've got a couple of room mics, and I run some figure of eights and some mid sides as well. I generally, I, for most sessions, I'll have at least fourteen mics. That's a lot. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. But then sometimes I'm adding more as well. Okay. Um, and you find the room mics really bring something to to, to the uh, sound? Unfortunately, I've got a crap sounding room. But what I what I what I can do is I've I've, I've treated it enough where it's dead enough, so it doesn't right. really. Do on the sound um, okay and, and then i'll use my 57 i've got a 57 up here behind which is capturing the kit as an overall blend i don't use the audio of that i use that to feed a reverb so uh -huh. oh i see so it goes, so goes pre-fader and then that then just feeds the reverb and that way i can make the room sound like anywhere i want oh, okay reverb nice um, nice good idea and then sometimes I'll lash up, like these Nashville sessions I've just been doing, like, like I decided to lash up a, a, a figure of eight microphone with a cardioid, so I'm getting like mid-side recording, so I can actually give that pseudo kind of narrow. Audio. Okay, that's great. Some room Excellent. Yeah. Martin, do you think we can have you back in the room? Because we need, we need to stop in three minutes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay? That's an amazing setup, though. Four, <laughs> 14 mics. Wow, it's a lot. Sounds good, though. Looks good as well. Yeah, it looks really good. Yep, I'm back in the room. Oh, that, that, was, was, that quick. was speedy. That was quick. Wow. He's um, yes. a pro. It's, 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 co it's a compact, small studio. Don't yeah. worry. What, what, I can't, what, what I can't believe is that everything is working. I know. There's no. There's been no oh, technical man. Tell problems. me about it. it, does, it <laughs> that's hours of my life. I've spent, you know, days, days and days and, you know, yeah. yeah. It all works good. Amazing. We, we, we've really enjoyed having you on today for the podcast. Um, we it are running great. out of time, so unfortunately I have to end it there. Um, but no I was actually digging around on the Planet Drum YouTube and I did find some videos that you guys did a while ago. A um, long time ago. Is that somewhere long... like my, my yellow Mr. Noisy t-shirt? That was the first yeah, session yeah, I did. Yeah, I, remember yeah. that. I remember that. It was about 35 degrees in that room that day. It was baking. Nothing's was, changed. They're still that. warm. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I'll, I'll get you, if you send me over some links to anything, some videos, I'll put them in the podcast so people can have a watch of those. If not, I might put some yeah. of these great Planet Drum ones in there. Um, but yeah, it was lovely to speak to you and hopefully we'll see you again in person soon. Yeah, that'd be lovely too.